welcome William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy and in this video I'd like to provide students with some help in studying lesson two of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy's classical mythology course, classical mythology. In this lesson um, we, we deal with a number of, of very important topics and that's why I, I'm eager to make a video uh, for this lesson to help students not only study and learn the content of the lesson, but also enjoy some of these other benefits that can be drawn from this lesson by, by reflecting carefully on the lesson and by considering the lesson in light of our Christian faith. So I'd like to walk through the content of lesson two in classical mythology and draw attention to a few different ideas and, and topics that I think are worthy of discussion. Up on the board here, I've, uh, I've written out a, something of a summary of, of the lesson, of the content of Lesson 2. Um, it can be a, a bit of a difficult lesson because there's, uh, there's a good amount of information, but there's also uh, a number of, of uh, Latin terms that are used that readers might not be f familiar with. And, and in all reality, they're, they're not that important. Um, uh, all of the details uh, should be studied, of course, and the assessments in the lesson, there's both a quiz and a written assessment, uh, they'll help the student to develop mastery and, and demonstrate that mastery and, and provide a sufficient standard for what needs to be learned. From this lesson, but I'd like to quickly walk through the content of the lesson and then talk about some applications of this lesson in classical mythology to the Christian faith and, and arguments that we may hear and things we may face as Catholics as we talk about these things. Now, the first question that I'd like to ask students to think about when we talk about Greek and Roman gods and goddesses and all these different ideas of, of ancient religion and mythology, I'd like to ask students to always think about the origin of these ideas. Where did these ideas come from? When did the Greeks or Romans start thinking about these gods and goddesses, these names, these characters? Where did these ideas come from? Uh, did, did the Romans and Greeks just make them up for fun? Were they just, you know, uh, fictional stories that they made up to entertain themselves? Were they some sort of uh, propaganda created by political leaders to try and control the people or, or influence public opinion? Uh, were they part of some kind of conspiracy theory? Uh, were they something that was that was real and experiential for the people were there real revelations did, did spirits actually appear to ancient Greeks and Romans uh, I'd like you to think about these questions as you study ancient literature ancient philosophy and history and ask where did these ideas about the ancient Greek and Roman gods and goddesses come from um, often these ideas are made to appear silly by, by modern authors or teachers that have no respect for them and frankly don't really understand them or think much about them. Um, and I think that if we do think about them rightly, we'll find that there's a lot of, of very interesting and important uh, topics to think about and talk about when we talk about the ancient uh, Greek and Roman gods and goddesses and other mythological characters and stories. Um, when we consider the question, where do these ideas come from? Where do these ideas come from? We have to ask, in general, where, where do man's religious thoughts and ideas come from? Where do these ideas come from? Why can't we just all be atheists and and just stop talking about religion. Why do we always seem to continue going back to, to ideas about gods and angels and spirits and, and heaven and hell and all of these 
supernatural, um, invisible uh, topics and, and ideas? What is it in us that that, that makes us always interested in these questions about gods and, and religion and so on. These are important questions for us to ask, and when we study ancient mythology, we have an opportunity to look into the minds and thoughts and beliefs and experiences of ancient people. And we have to always remember to keep things in their chronological Context. So think about when these ideas uh, were being taught, when these ideas were held, when the sources of these ideas were written, um, and compare that, always compare that to the events in Christian history, like the coming of Christ, the founding of the church, and so on. So we want to ask the question, where did these ideas come from? And there are a number of theories, and the most, the most popular theory that we'll hear um, in, in our society, especially among um, non-Catholic Christians or Protestants, is that these, these Greeks and Romans just made these things up to justify their desire to be sinful. They, they basically created ideas of gods that were based on their own human character and faults and basically worshipped themselves. Um, that may certainly be true for some people, but we always have to remember that the Greeks and Romans weren't all evil people. There were many extremely wise and virtuous men among the Greeks and Romans. And so it's false to say that these ideas of the ancient gods and goddesses were simply some invention of, of immoral or wicked people. That's not necessarily true. Um, the truth is more complicated than that would, would have us to believe. And so we need to get into it. We, we, we really don't care what the immoral, foolish ancient people thought and practiced. But we are interested, we should be interested, in what the, the virtuous pagans thought and believed and practiced when it came to religion. Now, as we consider the question, where do these ideas about gods and goddesses and religion come from among virtuous people, among, among good ancient people, wise ancient people? The answer is that they come from a certain kind of philosophical um, meditation or reflection. And if you think about uh, ancient Greek philosophy, uh, you'll know that one of the, the mottos of ancient philosophy was know thyself. Know thyself. Uh, man was encouraged in philosophy to study himself. To study himself. And by meditating on himself, by understanding his own nature, it was believed that man could look at himself almost as, as a mirror of the gods or of God. Man was to understand uh, the creator or, or the gods um, by examining himself. And so... What would happen is, as man would meditate on himself, he'd start to notice many different qualities in himself. He'd notice that, that some men are virtuous, some men are courageous, some men are prudent, some men are physically strong, some men are musically gifted, some men have great power of speech or, or thinking or persuasion. Um, men have different qualities. And so the, the ancient people would think that since, ancient, since people have different qualities and there are different kinds of people, perhaps there are different gods who represent the perfections of these qualities. So if we take a warlike man and we see this man and he's just built for war, 
he's courageous, he's gifted in martial arts. And we look at a man like that, we say, this man must resemble, must be an, an image of a god who is a god of war. And it would lead to the development of the idea of a god of war. And we could look at a woman and say, well, this woman is, is, is so beautiful. Everything about her, there's something about her that's just beautiful. Not just her appearance, but the way she looks, the way she talks, the way she acts. She's beautiful. And we get this idea from this woman. We get this idea of, of beauty, of feminine beauty. And so we then translate that idea to say there must be a goddess who is the goddess of, of beauty, of feminine beauty, the perfection of this idea of feminine beauty. And we go through that kind of thinking with all of the different human virtues, wisdom, um, you know, craftsman skills, uh, all of these different, these different skills and gifts and talents and, and virtues that we find in human beings. And we, we reason that these, these virtues must have some model or perfection in some divine being. And so we move from the meditation of our, on ourselves and the study and contemplation of our own virtues, and we translate them by comparison and think of beings that are divine, that lack our weaknesses, that lack our limitations, like, uh, like our mortality, the fact that we die. We imagine a being that, that has all of our virtue in the, the greatest degree and yet is free of our defects. And that idea becomes what we think of as God. And because there are different virtues, there are different gods. It, it's really not a crazy idea. We also have to remember that, that these were the ideas of people who lacked the light and the benefit of divine revelation. And so we need to judge their ideas not by comparing them with the content of sacred scripture or divine revelation, but we need to compare these ideas with what men could have believed, which was far inferior. Men could have just devoted their whole lives to immorality and sin and evil and violence, but instead we find men um, admirably and virtuously meditating on virtue and on, on, on divine beings. And, and there's something human and natural and good about this ancient religion. And over time, uh, this becomes uh, easy to understand, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But anyway, what happened in the ancient world is that there was an order of men on earth, men were divided into different ranks on earth, and it was reasoned that the gods must be ordered in a similar system or a similar set of, of ranks that was a mirror or a parallel of what we see among men. In the ancient world, there were three classes of men, and, and we're talking specifically of, of ancient Roman society here. There were three classes of men. The highest class, the first class, were known as the patricians, or senators. The patricians. These were the men who belonged to the great and ancient, powerful families that always ruled and held power in ancient Rome. These men were known as the patricians. The lower class, let's look at the lower class next. The lower class were known as plebeians. Plebeians, they were the lower class. They were, they were the common people, the ignoble people, the common people, the plebeians. But in between the patricians and the plebeians was a second or middle class. And these were known as the new men, the new men. 
And this middle class was a, was a rank of men who by their own life and work and merit moved from the plebeian class into something like the patrician class by their own virtue, by their own merit. An example of a new man in ancient Rome was Cicero. Cicero was one of these new men. So we have these three ranks of men in ancient Roman society. Three ranks, but really two divisions. Because these first two ranks, the patricians and the new men, were together a class of nobles, or the nobility. The nobility, the patricians and the new men formed a nobility. Both of them were noble. The question was, how did one become noble? The patricians were noble by birth. The new men were noble by their own achievement and merit. And the plebeians were outside of the nobility, or ignoble, as they're called. Okay, And this is how human society in ancient Rome was ordered. Now, when we, we learn about the Roman understanding of the gods, it was arranged in the same way. The same way that men were arranged on earth, the gods and goddesses were arranged in let's just say, a spiritual realm, okay? At the top, the highest class were what were called the select gods, the select gods and goddesses. And you can see here that there were 20 select gods and goddesses, and these are listed in your lesson. The 20 select gods and goddesses. Of these 20 select gods, there was a, a class of 12 of the select gods who were known as the consentes. The consentes were the 12 highest and most influential gods and goddesses who basically formed a council of the gods who, that ruled the world. And so in this council, we have the highest and most powerful gods and goddesses like Jupiter, Juno, Venus, Minerva, Mars, Mercury, and so on. The most famous, the most powerful, the, the most uh, exalted and select gods and goddesses were among the twelve consentes or council members. That was the highest class and then there were eight others that made up the whole number of the 20 select god, and these included gods and goddesses like, like Janus and Bacchus and Pluto, uh, Sol and Luna, um, and uh, two others uh, that, that are not on the tip of my tongue, but are in your lesson. So you can see the 20 select gods, 12 of whom were consentes, or, or, the, or the council, uh, the gods and goddesses of the, of the divine council. That was the highest class of, of the Roman gods and goddesses. And then the second class that paralleled the human second class were known as the inferior gods and goddesses. And just as we learned with men, this lower class of, of gods were gods who were not were not born into this divine power. They, they were not merely the, the heirs and, and descendants of the gods, but they were, they were inferior, and they became divine. They became divine through their own merits, just like the new men on earth. The inferior gods became gods, became celestial gods, part of the spiritual nobility, by their own achievements and merits. So we have two different ranks of gods. Both of them are celestial gods, just as the two different ranks of men were both members of the nobility. Okay, so a parallel system between men and gods. And then lastly, the third group were semones. 
semones, which is, notice, not celestial gods. So these are not gods that are considered to be in the heavens. The semones were, um, our, our book helpfully explains, they were half men, half men, half God. Uh, and, they, and they were basically men who were virtuous, so virtuous that they were considered greater than normal mortals, greater than men, but not celestial gods. And so they were gods, but not of the celestial rank. These were the semones, the, the half-men. Okay, so that, that gives us a simple overview of how the ranking of men on earth paralleled, in the Roman understanding, the ranking of gods in the spiritual realm. I don't want to say in heaven, because the Simones were not celestial gods. All right? So in the spiritual realm, there was an order that paralleled the order of the earthly realm. Okay, so... When we go back to this question, where did these ideas come from? These ideas came from a philosophical reflection of men or by men on their own earthly life. And they saw order in the human realm. And so they assumed that what was present on earth must also be present among the gods and goddesses. And so this system is not foolish, it's not crazy, it's quite reasonable. The, the fault of this system is that man is on earth. Man is outside of this council of divine beings or this, this assembly of divine beings. Man is outside relying on reason and his own experience to draw conclusions, to, to deduce truths or knowledge about these divine beings that, that he really can't be certain of. He can only say things that, that make sense or that are, that are similar to earthly things and that are therefore possible or probable. And that's the best that men can do in religion when they're left to reason. That's natural human religion. And when we look at this, from the perspective of natural human religion, we have to respect what they were able to put together. It makes sense. It was possible. It was probable even. Um, and it, it stood in a, in, a, in a reasonable parallel to the order of human life on earth. So it's not foolish or crazy. It's, it's reasonable and, and pretty simple and easy to understand. Man, working to know himself and then consider himself a mirror of the divinity or of the divine beings, seeing that there are differences among men, assuming that there must also be differences among gods and goddesses, seeing that there are ranks among men, and assuming reasonably that there may be ranks among gods and goddesses, developed a system of religious ideas, a mythology that was based on reason, that was reasonable, and, and added some order and sense to human life and experience that, that made it valuable to the people. It made sense out of human experiences. Okay, So that's what we have in the ancient Roman understanding of gods and goddesses and the order of the gods and goddesses, and that's the topic of lesson two in classical mythology. Now, I'd like to just make a couple of, of what I consider interesting comments on this system. One thing that, that non-Catholics will often criticize Catholics for is they'll say that Catholics take these ideas and simply copy them and Catholic theology or Catholic doctrine comes from these ancient pagan ideas. That's not necessarily true. 
Because as I said, these pagan ideas were based on human realities. They were based on human experiences, on human reflection, on human meditations. And therefore, they are reasonable and natural. They make sense. They're possible. Now, when we find later in history that Catholic doctrine in some ways compares or aligns with the ancient mythology, it's not necessarily because Catholics are copying this and simply claiming it for their own or using it to create their own religious system. We're not simply copying the Roman system and making it our own. There is already some truth in this system. And the truth that's present in this ancient religious system is also found present in the true religion of the Catholic Church. And so just because there are things in common doesn't mean that the Catholic faith which comes after the ancient Roman religion is therefore a copy of that religion. That's a logical fallacy. Just because Catholicism comes later and has some similarities does not mean that it is a copy of that earlier system. The reason why they're similar is because there's truth in this system, truth that's observable in the natural world, in the world of men. And so we shouldn't be surprised then when we find some parallels and similarities, even many parallels and many similarities between the ideas that were found in a human religious system among the ancient Romans and the true religion of the Catholic faith. And let me give you a clearer illustration of this. If we think about the um, if we think about God, first of all, we think of the Trinity. The Trinity can be compared to these consentes, or the select divine persons. Okay, We can compare the Trinity to this highest class of gods. Not saying the Trinity is a multitude of gods. The Trinity is three persons in one divine being. One God, three persons. Comparable to the highest order of the gods in the Roman system. If we think of the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, we find that her position as Queen of Heaven, she is very much like, or she, she has something of the idea of the inferior gods in the Roman system. She earned a place in Heaven through her own merit. She's like the inferior gods in the Roman system. And then the semones, or half-men, are like the saints in the Roman system. Now, note that I'm not saying that these ideas of gods and goddesses in the Roman system express the ideas of, of the Trinity and the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints in Catholic theology. I'm saying that there are some similarities in this pagan religion based on reason, based on human experience, and the true Catholic faith. So there are interesting parallels. It doesn't mean that Catholicism took those ideas from pagan religion. That is, that's not a logical argument. That's just an assumption that, that cannot be proven. So that's, that's an important issue that comes up in a lot of discussions about the Catholic faith. Catholicism is often accused of just plundering the pagans, as it were, taking their religious ideas and then building a man-made system of, of religion with the Trinity and the Virgin Mary and the saints, and, and Catholics are accused of just making all of that up to be like the ancient pagans. It's true. In some ways, it does resemble the religion of the ancient pagans, but it's not because the Catholic Church copied the ancient pagans. That's certainly not true.
So, I hope that's a helpful overview of lesson two. There's much more detail for the lesson in your book, which I'd like you to study. As I said, there's a quiz and a written assignment for lesson two that provides some challenging assessment to help develop and allow you to demonstrate your mastery. I hope you find this video helpful. If there's anything in this video you'd like to talk about, get into in more detail, feel free to contact me either on the, the forums in the academy or by email at mail at classicalliberalarts.com. That's all for tonight for uh, lesson two in classical mythology. I invite you to study the course and go through it with me. I'll make videos whenever I consider it to be helpful and good for these studies. God bless your studies.